Um, great. Um, Jürgen, thank you very much indeed. It's very nice to be here. So I am um, predominantly an adult dermatologist, um, and I have a particular interest in eczema. And there's a huge amount happening um, in the eczema world at the moment. So it's a very exciting um, field to be in. So all of us have seen eczema, I'm sure. It's really common. Eczema is actually lots of different diseases. Um, and it's almost, it's quite a hard thing to say what is eczema, except it's inflamed, itchy skin. And there's lots of different types, contact eczema, seborrheic eczema, osteototic eczema. But the, the major sort, which is what I'm really going to be concentrating on, is atopic eczema. This is the commoner garden eczema, um, which affects about 20% of children, um, about 8% of adults, and has become much more prevalent, much more common over the last 40 years. When Jürgen was young, hardly anybody had this. Um, whereas now, um, all these decades later, um, it's really, it's really uh, very common indeed. And, and what you have is you have redness of the skin, the inflammation, you have edema, swelling, um, itching, cracking, crusting. So a common and disabling condition. And it varies in severity. And really dependent on the severity depends what treatment you get and where you get it. From the mildest sort, bits of emollients, through to the most severe, which can be hospital admissions, potent drugs. Um, so here we've got um, a fairly typical patient of mine um, with bad eczema, super chap, um, who I've been seeing for ages, haven't cured him. Um, you don't cure eczema, of course, you treat it. And that's actually something important to tell your patients. I say it's a little like, it's a little like hunger, you know, eating never cured hunger. You wake up, you're hungry, you have breakfast. By lunchtime, it's failed. Option A, do you try something different? Meditation. Option B, do you have lunch? Most of us go for lunch. And, um, uh, and it's the same with eczema. You say, look, we're not going to cure it. We're going to treat it. You have to keep on putting those treatments on because some people are expecting us to cure it, and that's not the case. So Toby here, you know, very red, scaly, itchy chest, um, dry. And, and when it's really acute, you'll get, it'll be very red and might be weeping. As it becomes chronic, it becomes dry and scaly and often thickened as you scratch away. So here he is on his back. I'm really most disabling, not sleeping, a, a horrible thing to have. So, um, and his ears again, so really very itchy and scaly and just an unpleasant thing to have. So what causes it? Well, this of course, um, our understanding of the causes of eczema has really gone through a revolution in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, very much immunology and allergy was the predominant thing. It was a, a predominant immunological disorder, we thought. Um, and, uh, and so we very much concentrated on steroids, on the anti-inflammatory agents. And a, one particular paper completely put this understanding on its head. So Erwin McLean up in Dundee found a gene that very strongly links with eczema, a gene called filagrin. So half of eczema patients um, have got a variation in the filagrin gene. And the filagrin gene, filagrin protein, is a barrier protein in the skin. So we knew that eczema patients have got leaky skin. It's dry, um, water comes out of it far too easily, so what we call transepidermal water loss. It's leaky skin. And suddenly we found that half of eczema patients have got a deficiency in filagrin, as opposed to 5% of the healthy population. And it completely changed our thinking from this predominantly being an immunological disorder to maybe it's a barrier disorder. I love this. I'm not very clever. I never understood immunology. I'd hear words like Fox P3. You know, you're going to tell me about something and my eyelids would grow heavy. I would just sort of, and suddenly here we were, we were saying it's a barrier defect. So you've got leaky skin. It's leaky, so water gets out, which is why eczema patients have got dry skin. And at the same time, that leakiness allows allergens to get in. So maybe all these changes were just, you know, leaky skin, allergens get in, and there's a secondary reaction. So if it is predominantly a barrier defect, can you prevent or treat eczema by restoring the barrier? So two groups 
at almost exactly the same time, set up almost exactly the same study. Hal Williams, who's our kind of one of our leading eczema experts in Britain down in Nottingham, and a Japanese group in Japan, both set up almost identical clinical trials. So the idea was that if you've got this dry barrier, allergens get in through that leaky skin and they spark off these inflammation. So Howell and the Japanese group said, hang on, let's set about putting moisturizer emollients on the skin from birth. And these studies were almost identical. So if one of your parents has eczema, you've got about a 50% chance of developing eczema by the age of six months, as opposed to the background rate of eczema is about 20%. So what these two studies did were they took babies born to parents where one of them had eczema, and from birth, moisturizer was applied all day uh, to each child every day. So half of them had moisturizer every day, the other half did what they normally did. So six months later, so this is looking at the people without eczema. So this is the control group, this line. So as you can see, at six months, about 40% of children don't have eczema, 60% do have eczema, which is what you would expect. The group and the findings were identical for both studies. The group that had moisturizer applied every day, only about 30% of them had developed eczema at six months. So both of these papers were published in the same issue of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, Jackie, um, in 2014. And longer term studies are going on. So here, this seemed to support the idea that eczema is predominantly due to leaky skin, due to a genetic defect leading to leaky skin. And you can reduce the chances. Of course, what we don't know is do they get eczema later? Do you just postpone it? Do you prevent it altogether? Do you have to carry on doing this for life? But certainly very interesting and important studies suggesting that eczema is predominantly a barrier defect. Great for me, I didn't have to learn immunology. But there is, of course, this immensely complex immunological process going on in the skin of eczema patients. We have um, overexpression of this whole immune system, the Th2 cytokines, Th22, and then Th1 with time. So you have this very complex milieu going on. And I'm, going to, I'm just going to flick over this slide because at the end, I'm going to come back to this wave of new drugs we're about to get treating eczema, all of which target the immune system. And these drugs are even better than moisturizers applied from birth. So that's where we are. So that's a little bit about the barrier defect in eczema. So atopic eczema, atopic patients have a tendency to produce IgE very readily. So if you measure the IgE levels in eczema patients, they tend to be um, very high, generally. And of course, within that, you also get specific IgEs. So finding an elevated IgE by itself does not mean that avoiding house dust, mites, pollen, or whatever is going to prevent your eczema. The fact is atopic patients have very high levels of IgE. They tend to have the Th2 cytokine skewing. And then the pattern of eczema changes through life. So as a baby, it's predominantly the face. And then in childhood, it moves on to your elbows and knees. And then most children, two thirds of them, seem to grow out of eczema by their adult life, but about a third continue with it. And in fact, there's different profiles and we're beginning to study this and we're finding that eczema is, atopic eczema is probably many diseases, some of which improve in teenage years, some of which don't. And we're starting to look at these different patterns of um, eczema progression through life. So here we are, classical behind the knees, hands, and so on. So the existing treatments, emollients, now of course I can tell my patients there's a high polluting reason to slap moisturizer on your skin, it's all to do with the genetic defect, but emollients are the mainstay. And from emollients you then move on to topical anti-inflammatory agents, predominantly that's corticosteroid creams, but also calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus, pimecrolimus. Then we can move on to phototherapy and systemic agents, and then beyond that, um, the new drugs which we're about to get. So, 
Um, here we are, emollients. Here's my daughter who's smearing um, an emollient all over her face. Um, so this is the basis of Exmary. You, short of drowning in a tub um, of emollient, you cannot overdose on them. Um, and the, the main sort of emollients are the leave-on emollients that we put on the skin and leave there. And those should go on as much as you can. Um, we differentiate between soap substitutes and leave-on emollients. So soap substitutes like aqueous cream or emulsifying ointments um, are used instead of, instead of soap. Because the problem with soap is actually dries out that skin. It damages that barrier further, um, which is one of the underlying problems with eczema. And we then have either, uh, for dry skin, we would have ointment emollients like Dermatologists love paraffin mix, 50-50. If somebody happily puts on 50-50, they've got severe eczema. It's hideous. Um, it's sticky. Your clothes stick to you. Your bed sheets stick to you. If a patient volunteers, they like to put that on, you know they've got bad eczema. And of course, it's, in, it's, it's uh, inflammable. Do not smoke in bed. Um, after covering herself in paraffin. I think there were, a couple of years ago, there were some big stories. It's been a big issue with people catching fire so, um, from their emollients. So for the dry, chronic eczemas, we use these um, ointment emollients. For the more acute, inflamed ones, which are more weeping than dry, we use cream emollients like oilatum or ovino or diprobase. Um, the next step up is to tackle that inflammation. I spend 95% of my time telling patients to use more steroid rather than less steroid. My advice when patients are given a steroid cream is they should open the box, remove the package insert, and burn before reading, okay? There's been a big problem with supply of many steroid creams. I'm sure part of that is the business model where a manufacturer provides steroid creams and then has an information sheet saying, don't use this. It's a very, or saying, use this incredibly sparingly. It may thin your skin. No wonder they can't sell the stuff because it's the only business I know would do this. Most people greatly underuse steroid creams. Of course, if overused, you have concerns about thinning of the skin. I hardly ever see that now. So you need to use, steroid creams come in different strengths. You need to use enough, um, you need to use enough of an adequately potent steroid to treat the eczema. The side effect of overuse of steroid creams is thinning of the skin. The much, much, much commoner side effect of underuse is horrible eczema. And don't be scared of the treatment. And there are some, some people use fingertip units. I, what I say to my patients when I'm trying to assess how much steroid they're using is how long does a tube of steroid last you? Because if so, an adult with eczema all over their body is going to need 100 grams a week. You know, that's a big tube a week. If you've got someone like Toby with extensive eczema, they should be getting through a tube a week and jump in there and turn that eczema off. And there is a steroid ladder. We divide steroid creams up into different strengths, mild, moderate, potent, or very potent. Now, the mild ones like hydrocortisone, you can buy over the counter um, in your local WH Smiths. Even the moderate steroids you can buy from a pharmacist without seeing a doctor. So that's a measure of actually relatively how safe these are. The fact you can buy hydrocortisone anywhere, this is not a dangerous drug. Um, it's the weakest of all the steroids. So you then move up from the mild to the moderate to the potent or very potent. Generally, once a day is enough for steroid creams. Um, if it's very bad, twice a day. But generally, once a day is enough. Emollients should go on at least twice a day, but really as much as you can manage it. And judging the strength of the steroid cream is dependent on two things, the age of the patient and the body site. Children have thinner skin than adults. So for them, we have to use the weaker steroids. You know, hydrocortisone is what you put on babies or children. Um, and as you get older, your skin gets thicker. And some body sites, like the hands and the feet, have got very thick skin. Our feet are designed for running around. Our hands are designed for handling things. They have got the, the stratum corneum is about 100 times thicker there than on the face. So on the hands and the feet, you have to use in adults, strong or very strong steroid creams. There's no point in putting anything weaker on because it just won't have an effect. Whereas for babies and the face, scrotum, thin areas, you'll be looking at the lower end like, like hydrocortisone and Umovate. So here we are the potencies. Um, 
Getting eczema better is easy. Enough moisturizer, enough steroid cream will get eczema better. What is difficult is keeping eczema good. So what we now recommend is rather than the traditional thing was to kind of wean steroids down, there have now been four or five trials where they have taken patients with eczema, divided them into two groups. Everyone gets emollient all day, every day. One group gets steroids every day when bad, stops when good, back again when bad. The other group gets steroid every day when bad, two days a week when their eczema's gone away, and then every day when bad. And paradoxically, the group putting steroid cream on their skin when they two days a week when they don't have eczema use less steroid cream over the course of a year than the group who only put steroid cream on when they're bad. And the reason for that is if you put steroid cream on two days a week when good, you reduce the frequency of your flares and a flare takes far more treatment than keeping it away. And two days a week of steroid cream will not thin your skin. So what you recommend to your patients is every day steroid cream when bad, two days a week when good for about three months, and then every day when bad. And that paradoxically limits the amount of steroid cream they use. And it's very effective at keeping your patients good. If your patients with eczema suddenly get bad, you need to think um, about infection. The two classic infect causes of infectious flares of eczema are bacterial infections, impetigo, staph aureus. So whereas about 15 or 20% of the healthy population carry staph aureus on the skin, pretty much every eczema patient carries staph on the skin. And most of the time the staph aureus sits there not doing anything, but from time to time it becomes pathogenic and invasive and causes impetigo, causes golden crusting and a sudden flare of the eczema. And we understand now that there's a lot of interest now in the microbiome, that the organisms that cover our skin. And what we know is that now, in the old days when you looked at the organisms on the skin, it was the kind of 19th century stuff. You took a swab, put it on agar plates, and what you grew was what you said was there. Now that we do RNA sequencing, 16S RNA sequencing, we have discovered that the microbial flora, the organisms on the skin, are vastly more numerous and more complex and more diverse than we had understood. And what is interesting is that eczema patients have got a far less diverse range of organisms on the skin than non-eczema patients. And as their eczema gets worse, that diversity reduces. So rather than a healthy Amazonian rainforest with millions of different species of organisms, we have a kind of monoculture of Sitka spruces on our skin, which is an unhealthy um, thing to have. And that reduction in microbial diversity seems to go along with um, a worsening of eczema. And that may be one of the reasons that eczema, atopic disease, certainly eczema, has become much commoner in the last 40 years, is with all these sterile weight wipes, antiseptic it's antiseptic that, there is a, a growing body of evidence suggesting that that rather sterile environment Certainly, it certainly correlates with this reduced microbial flora on our skin, my, microbial diversity on our skin, which seems to go along with eczema. So if you get a sudden crusting of goldenness, think, is this impetigo? It's staph aureus, treat the fluclox. And if you get these lots of punched out, really quite painful little lesions, um, think, is this a herpes simplex infection? Usually people, when people get cold sores on their lips or elsewhere if they're unlucky in love, it's a little cluster, quite localized. But eczema patients are not able to localize that infection and they get this very widespread thing called eczema peticum. And it, they don't look like little blisters, like classic cold sores. You get these little punched out lesions scattered all over and that needs a referral to a dermatologist and treatment with acyclovir. <clears throat> so you've got sign guidelines here, which really I've just sort of covered there, I think. Who should be referred to the dermatologist? Well, if you're not sure what the diagnosis is, um, if they're not getting better, if they're not... My wife's a GP full-time, and she sees, more, she sees more skin patients than I do as an academic dermatologist doing dermatology two days a week, because dermatolo the GPs see lots and lots of skin patients. So if they're not getting better, 
in primary care, send them up to us. Um, recurrent secondary infection and you know, sleep disturbance. So what are the things we've got to offer? Well, phototherapy, I'm a great fan of phototherapy. Um, light treatment is very good for people who've just got eczema, which is grumbling on, grumbling on, not getting better with topicals. Topical tacrolimus is very good for patients whose facial eczema um, is not getting better with mild to moderate steroid creams. Topical tacrolimus is about, it's almost as potent as a potent steroid, but doesn't thin the skin, and you couldn't use it. For children, you'd use pimecrolimus, um, the weaker form. Dietary modification. This is not something on which I'm an expert, because I don't do children's eczema. Under the age of two, um, probably around 10% of children can be improved with dietary modification. And I really would, would want to hand over to a pediatric dermatologist or someone like Jurgen for this. But, you know, eggs and milk are the classic ones here. And that's, I, I don't really want to comment further on that. Um, moving on beyond phototherapy, well, this is when we start to step in with drugs. And traditionally, the drugs we have used um, to treat eczema have been cyclosporin, which is the only licensed treatment. Um, although we use lots of drugs in, in eczema, only cyclosporin is licensed. And cyclosporin is only licensed for eight weeks, and we never use it for just eight weeks. People, you don't, someone doesn't come up and say, I've had dreadful eczema for 20 years. You say, great, I've got eight weeks treatment for you. They're just not interested. But that is the only licensed treatment, and we use methotrexate and azathioprine. They're pretty effective. There, is, there are no comparative trials. We don't know who they're most effective in. We have a huge deficit of knowledge here because these drugs are cheap as chips. No drug company is going to pay for the studies. But we are now, within British dermatology, um, a bunch of us around Britain are getting together and we are starting to, do a reg we're starting to collect registry data on all our eczema patients who we put on these drugs. We're starting to collect scoring data, IgE levels, histories, a common body of information, because we're actually, we need to find out how good these drugs are, um, particularly with the advent, we're about to get lots of very good but very expensive new drugs along, and we need to know how they compare with the drugs we've, we've currently got. Um, so we're doing these big studies, Eurostat and ASTAR, these are UK-wide studies to look at how good the existing drugs are. And then back to the fact that eczema isn't just a barrier defect. All this immunology is going on. And um, the very first of the biologics for eczema has just been approved here in Scotland by sign, I think, six weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> so methotrexate for years, about 30 pounds. Um, there's been a bit of a haggling. I was, I was one of the three experts on the NICE committee and then the, the sign, uh, Scottish equivalent, um, deciding uh, whether there was a need for these new biologics for eczema. There is, but then most importantly, how much the cost should be. And it was a fascinating process. Basically, there's a, the, what happens is NICE and science say, we'll pay so much for, uh, for, for improvement in health. And the, the Sanofi who made Dupilumab, the first of these drugs, had to decide, are they going to land the Waitrose model, as in not selling much of a very expensive drug, only for the very worst? Or are they going for the Aldi model, um, you know, for a sort of less severe disease and a much bigger market? And they've kind of gone, they've gone kind of Tesco's is what they've gone. They've gone kind of middle of the, middle of the road is what they've opted for. Um, so, so Dupilumab is going to be about £10,000 a year as opposed to methotrexate, £30 a year. Um, and dupilumab is the first. So at the moment in Lothian, it's been approved, everything else, but, but Lothian is sitting there thinking, oh God, you know, that's, we've probably got 400 patients or 250 patients that are eligible. How are we going to pay for this? So I'm waiting to write my first prescription. I've got my bad patients lined up the costs are going to be astronomical, and that, you know, that's, that's a separate thing. So dupilumab is the first targeted biologic, and it acts on this, um, these IL-4 receptors here, and it blocks that. The data look really good. It's given to the patients who failed on systemics, and the data look good. It causes conjunctivitis as a side effect. I'm longing to get my hands on it. So here we are. It was approved as a drug last year um, in Europe, so you can prescribe it, but who's going to pay for it? NICE said, yes, um, we'll pay for it in the NHS, and Lothian's trying to work out, oh, 
how much can we afford? But that's just the first. There are lots of new drugs coming up. So um, uh, dupilumab acts on IL-4, um, fezakinumab IL-22, and in fact some work which um, Jürgen and I have been doing here in Edinburgh, we have identified uh, with Chen Kanya, one of our partners, um, a pathway leading to IL-22, and there's drugs there coming out. Oral JAK inhibitors, we're about to start some trials on that, IL-31. There's um, this understanding of immunology. There are lots and lots of drugs. I quickly looked on clinicaltrials.gov um, yesterday. So there have been 240 clinical trials of new eczema treatments in the last five years. There are currently 56 ongoing. And um, he's just bad, actually. And so there's a lot, a lot going on. We're about to get, we're looking, we're picking and choosing which trials we're going to go in for here in Edinburgh because there's lots out there. And of course, if you're in a trial, your patients get free drug. Um, and so we're trying to work out, um, can we get into some of these trials, which means our control group get dupilumab, active get the new drug. It's a bit of a Ponzi scheme. You know, that keeps us going for another couple of years so that trial's finished. And in the end, all the trials have been done. You've got to pay for the drugs. But there's lots going on. Um, it, here's my, my final slide. I, I was appointed here almost 20 years ago. At my interview, my consultant interview, Claire Benton, one of the interview panels, said to me, Richard, what conditions do you think we treat badly in dermatology? And I'm, oh my God, I've prepared for every question, but not that. It's a trick question. What does she mean? What's the answer? And I can't remember what my answer was. But I, once I'd been appointed, I said, Claire, look, what were you fishing for? And she was saying eczema. You know, we've had no methotrexate, um, azathioprine, steroids. These have been around for the last 60 years, and there's been no new treatments. This is a horrible disease. There's no treatments. Well, 20 years after that interview, and she was quite right, we treated eczema terribly. We have these fantastic new treatments coming up, and I think it's going to really change the nature of what we can offer our patients with eczema. So... Thank you. Thank you.